All right, folks, we are back at the Miami Book Fair 2016. I'm Rich Folly. This is PBS Book View Now, and what a pleasure to be sitting with Dana Perino right now, Thank whose you. book is And the Good News Is. Boy, we could all use some good news <laughs> that everybody can share in, yes. you know, that the entire country can share in. Uh, welcome, first Thank of all. Thank you. Yeah, so nice to have you. The Miami Book Fair, let's start there. This is a wonderful event. There's so many writers of different styles here. How's your experience well, it's, so far? Um, I know that to be a very prestigious book fair, and I partly I know that because I've sent a few authors here. In 2010, I did the publicity for George W. Bush's biography, Decision Points, or autobiography. Right. Um, and so I brought him here, and we had an event, and I never imagined that I would have a chance to come back as an author. So when the invitation came through, I said yes. That was the first one I said yes to. Yeah, well, it's the first one that I think there ever was. It's one of the largest and oldest in the United States. It's an am amazing event, and, and like I said, we're so glad you're here. And Miami is one of the world's best cities. It's so cosmopolitan. Obviously, the weather is great, but there's such a vibrancy here. Great place for entrepreneurs. So, yeah, yeah. a lot of promise and here in Miami. you can hear the vibrancy. It's all I around can hear us. It. Yeah, there's a thumping bass line that maybe <laughs> people watching can't hear, but we can certainly feel under our feet. Um, let's go talk about your book. You're a former White House press secretary. You're from, you appeared in the Fox 5. Um, you're, we're coming off of a, a really brutal presidential election. That's the sort of setting for this book that we're talking about right now. But let's go back first and talk about your own experiences mm -hmm. in the White House and the role that George W. Bush played in your life. You talked about doing some yeah. of his promotion, but what an amazing job to have in the middle of that seat of power. Talk about yeah. how that sort of influenced everything for you. Well, the book is autobiographical, autobiographical for myself, which um, part of me thought, well, I'm only, at the time, I was like 42 or something, so I'm like really ready to write a biography. But um, I wanted to do two main things with it. I, because I was the first Republican woman to ever be the White House press secretary, I got asked by a lot of people, like, how did you get that job? And what advice do you have for me going forward? So the subtitle of the book is Lessons and Advice from the Bright Side. Right. So I talk about how did I end up there? Because I didn't grow up in the world of politics. My family weren't big donors. I grew up on the eastern side of Wyoming. Um, people think that either I'm from Texas or if I'm, if I'm, since I'm from Wyoming, they think I knew the Cheneys and that that's how I got my job. And it's, it just didn't happen that way. Um, I wanted to be a journalist. I studied um, at University of Illinois, got a graduate degree there, started working in local news, and that just wasn't for me. Ended up in Washington. Fast forward a few bits, and um, it was right after 9-11 that a friend of mine that I'd worked with on Capitol Hill asked me to come back and work at the Justice Department with her. And so I did that as a spokesperson, and about nine months later got pulled over to the White House and served as the Deputy Press Secretary, which was a fabulous job. Um, I always, one of the pieces of advice I give in the book is that always take the deputy job if it's offered to you. Right. Less because heat, you learn lots everything. Of learning. And you learn everything. Like you work holidays and weekends, but that's how I got to, do jo to know George W. Bush very well. So he came to trust me, not just my judgment, but my character. So I, in this book, I peel back the curtain and I talk about some scenes where the press, when the press wasn't there and what it was like to work with him, um, not only visiting wounded warriors or like when my dad came to the White House, it was a really big deal for me um, and, and President Bush made that nice and smooth. Um, and then I talk about t times when he and I conspired with each other to uh, stand up for a young woman who was being bigfooted out of an opportunity to ask him a question because one of the big networks had decided to slot in a, a, a man instead of her, and I thought it was unfair, and he agreed with me, but we never told her that it happened, so nice. all that's in the book. Yeah, you, you do get a lot of questions from young people, and yeah. your story for me is unique because there weren't connections like that. None. You worked and you found your way to those people, and yep. you worked your way up. Yep. That's a story that not everybody can say. When you're in the White House, somebody's usually delivering you in there. It's hard to just kind of land in there. Well, it's not completely unique. Obviously, there are, America is the place where you can do anything if you put your mind to it. One of the things I talk about in here is that, um, especially young women, you have to start building your network very early. So networking is not a verb that I like very much. Uh, you make friends, mm -hmm. and then friends call upon you. So like my friend who called me from the Justice Department right after the attacks of 9-11, she knew me and knew that I would be willing to come back, so I left San Diego, I moved back to D.C., and then it's just through hard work. Another piece of advice in there that's a really good one that I like to tell people is take the jobs that nobody else is going for. Right? If you can do the jobs that are sort of seen as like, oh, not that high profile, um, or maybe not that glamorous. Uh, like I was at the White House Council on Environmental Quality. I did that for two and a half years. Ari Fleischer, the press secretary, never had to worry about a story about the Department of Interior or Energy or EPA because he knew I could handle it. 
that's how I end up being the deputy press secretary and then President Bush makes me the press secretary at the end. You know, I love that advice. It's, it's the advice that I give to my kids. It's the advice you've, you give. There's an old school element though to it. There's a lot of people who might dismiss or scoff at that sort of like, what, I can get there. I know how to do this. That's well, the and they're in a hurry. Think. Right, people are always in a hurry. Yeah. And in fact, there's this like, I wouldn't say that it's like a standard because I see a lot of hardworking young people out there who are yeah. taking the hard road too. It's true. But there is sort of this idea that like there's an, that's the old way and then there's this sort of new way. Well, the, the title of the book is And the Good News Is, and I use that s several times throughout the book. It's what I used to say when I went into the Oval Office to deliver bad news. Mm -hmm. I would always try to follow it up with something good. Mm -hmm. if I, sometimes I had to reach <laughs> for whatever sometimes. that was. Um, but the other thing is, so I'm a firstborn daughter. You have children? Yeah, four. Okay, is the oldest one like really like nervous? Like no, supposed actually, to plan everything? No. Well, then you've been a very he's, good dad. He is a planner. He's a planner. He's not, not nervous, yeah. Okay, so usually firstborn children are planners. I'm yeah. a good example of that. And I would make out elaborate, like not spreadsheets, but outlines of like how my life was going to be and what was going to happen when. Fascinating. And I write in this book, like if I look at all the points of my life where my career had a leap or I met my husband on an airplane, not planned. Right. And he's British. Some serendipity in 18 your life. 18 years older than me. Yeah, that every time I made a plan, God had a different idea in mind. And what's most important is to be open to that, that if something comes up in your life, like an opportunity to move to Beijing and work in public relations, take it. Yeah. Because you never know where it might lead. Yeah. You, you worked in the White House at a time that was, I think there was a lot of differences of opinion. It felt very strong at the time. It doesn't feel, it feels almost quaint to me now, thinking back on the George W. Bush Can you believe administration that? when I thought I saw anger in the country and I saw like yeah. people not... Uh, well, so there great. was, but... There was, of course. I don't mean to diminish what was happening at the time, but yeah. it does seem like it's intensified now. As somebody who's been in there, has been in the middle of it, who's dealt with it, your perspective on the split that we're seeing right now and the level of, of, of frustration on both sides yeah. with, the, with the other side. Talk about that. Well, there's no doubt that America is a, a polarized nation, okay? But um, I don't know if it's any worse. One of the things President George W. Bush talked to me about was that, yes, of course, we're a divided country, but he was coming out of college um, right around the time of the height of the Vietnam War and those protests. And he said, America is not as divided as it was then. He said, so, and also then you could go back in history and other times that the country was divided, obviously, um, with the biggest being our civil war. So he, had, he was somebody that was very optimistic about America. With a historical perspective. Yes, yeah. and, and, and yes, and also being um, keeping everything relative. So one of the things that I would be asked about in that last year was, what does the president want his legacy to be? And I remember he would say, look, Dana, I read three books about George Washington last year, and if the first president is still having historians analyze the presidency, then the 43rd doesn't have a lot to worry about. Yeah. Because he'll never know what it is. You just have to do your best and move on. And I think that that will settle down a little bit in the country. Um, we also have a lot of different ways and tools and tactics of talking to each other. So in some ways, politics now is even much more personal than it was when I was the White House press secretary. I didn't even have a Twitter account when I was the press secretary. I sort of got one later on and right. basically now our used it to... Our president-elect has one. The president-elect has one, and he speaks directly to his supporters. Right. And to me, my, my job as press secretary, I sort of felt was 50% advocating and defending the President of the United States and 50% advocating and defending the media's access to the government. Yeah. Because our founding fathers are really smart when they set it up. So now we have a President-elect though who's skipping over your old job. That's right. You know, and going right over even the press secretary. Right. What, I mean, imagine yourself as a press secretary with that happening. There's a nervousness to that, obviously. What, what well, would you I be think like as press secretary? Well, I think part of me is, I've decided I'm going to embrace the chaos. <laughs> and, and, and there's a saying in Buddhism that... Um, don't try to push the river, but flow with it. Right. Now, that doesn't mean that you excuse bad behavior or that you don't speak up if you think something is wrong, because obviously we, I have tools to do that too. Yeah. Um, I'm on a television show. I have access to Twitter as well, etc. cetera. Um, the principles of the job of press secretary are not going to change. Um, you have to get information to the press. The, you have to get the questions from the press to the president. Um, it is a problem, for example, early on in the Obama administration, when Rahm Emanuel was the chief of staff, right. he knew all the reporters from the time when he was uh, working right. for Bill Clinton's, Clinton's office. And he often would call reporters you know, at right 6 o'clock in the morning without letting Robert Gibbs know right. and you know, 
sometimes as press secretary, you sort of want someone else to be the heavy, yeah. to be honest. Yeah. But usually, you'd rather be able to maintain those relationships yeah. to, but to yourself. On our last few seconds that we have, we have 30, 30 seconds or a minute or so, that, that camaraderie of former press secretaries that exists I love it. outside of party affiliation. Yep. What's that like? I love it. In fact, I had breakfast recently with Josh Ernest, Obama's uh, press secretary, and I said, why don't we meet so that we can talk about your transition out of the White House? And he said, well, yours was perfect. And I'm like, no, it wasn't. I made plenty of mistakes and let me help you. So we're, we have a great relationship. I'm good friends with Mike McCurry and others. So I hope that that will continue. That's a pretty cool club. Yeah, yeah. a good one. And it's great that you're a part of it and that you helped us today and joined us. I Thank love you. meeting you so Thank much. Thank you. Thanks so much. Folks, Dana Perino, the book is, and the good news is something we could all use, lessons <laughs> and advice from the bright side. There is a bright side out there. We'd love to know. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank I'm you. Rich Folly. You're watching PBS Book View now. This